area that's going to be continuously changing in such a changing landscape to put it mildly so i'll try and explain this as well as i can in terms of uh, how you use the data and how the current guidelines are structured in terms of choosing antibiotics especially in a hospital situation so the first thing is about getting the antibiotic right <clears throat> why do we have hospital antibiograms why do we have guidelines on empiric antimicrobial use very simply put it's very important to get the antibiotic right uh, like we talk about the golden hour for say a coronary intervention we talk about those things in uh, trauma we talk about that in um, uh, stroke things like that but we also know that outcomes are also very dependent on what we do very early on in sepsis the early goal directed therapy everybody is aware of but even today if we look at it a uh, receipt of correct antibiotics within 1 hour of recognition is still a very low percentage for those of you who are not sure of what you are uh, what your practice is i would suggest you go ahead and look at your or do an audit form an audit and look at when you identify a sepsis whether it's in the er whether it's in the ward whether it's in the icu and how long it takes for the first dose of antibiotics to go in the problem is there is a significant lag due to a lot of administrative reasons for example it may be that uh the antibiotic may be stored in a place that has been intended intended for and things like that there are so many bottlenecks so this one hour is something which is actually a little generous it should be half an hour but we want it at least within one hour it's also not just early it also has to be appropriate now while a lot of us may be succeeding in the early part of it there are quite a few errors happening in the appropriate part of it and that's what we're going to be discussing about uh it has to be appropriate in terms of route of therapy now that's easy for most uh, icu admissions and for that matter hospitalization it would have to be intravenous it cannot be subcutaneous it cannot be intramuscular it certainly cannot be oral that part is easy the dose and the frequency are often mis missed out the dosing the first dose is irrespective of the patient's any function liver kidney whatever because the first dose is only loading dose and it has to be a full dose for example if you are going to give meropenem the recommended dose would be to give 2 grams iv so that you flood the system with adequate meropenem to get very good blood levels and of course frequency and that's an area where a lot of mistakes happen i still see a lot of people using meropenem twice daily uh, cefiros and sulbactam twice daily and things like that unless we dose it aggressively enough and often enough and this is especially so for beta lactams where the principle is time above mic meaning the more often that you dose the beta lactam within the guidelines the more effective it is going to be so it is very very important to ensure that dosing is done correctly on the other hand i still see a lot of people dosing aminoglycosides multiple times a day and that actually is counterproductive studies have shown that aminoglycosides when given once daily have a higher peak and therefore higher efficacy and a lower trough and therefore lower side effect profile so both of these happen we underdose the drug we under uh, yeah uh, we don't dose beta lactams often enough very often and we unnecessarily split the aminoglycoside dose both of which are counterproductive we also have to look at penetration into the area so for example e coli in the urinary stream aminoglycosides are amazing the same e coli in the lung aminoglycosides really really suck and finally sidality i'm not going to go too much into sidality part of it today uh, simply because it's been belabored uh, in one of the six uh, uh, conferences couple of years ago i discussed this in very great detail and except for febrile neutropenia actually even for endocarditis and osteomyelitis and uh, even cns infection sidality is over uh, spoken as a important factor so static and sidal make no not much of a difference in terms of ultimate outcomes it's about choosing the right drug for the right uh, situation and uh, statics versus sidal is more of a boogeyman rather than a real problem this is from anand kumar back in 2006 actually where he broke up uh, time of uh, time to administration of effective antimicrobial therapy and survival and what we know is that even half an hour makes a difference uh, when we say 0.49 that's 0.49 of an hour that's half an hour so if you can get the antibiotic in within half an hour of identifying sepsis or in this case hypotension septic shock it clearly makes a difference to outcome so you want to get the right antibiotic in as quickly as possible otherwise mortality starts rising very very quickly and this is something which uh, a lot of us would know instinctively 
but we are not probably measuring this to see exactly where we are dosing and from what i can see a lot of people end up dosing it only by the second hour or maybe even by the third hour and that's something which causes needless increase in mortality and it can be um, improved by a simple intervention of course this is part of the sepsis bundle which also includes taking blood cultures which have a separate reduction in mortality and also the bundled care in terms of uh, fluid resuscitation and other icu parameters being looked at aggressively so uh, does it make a difference what antibiotic we give uh, studies have shown that if you do not give the most effective antibiotic survival is actually very poor so in this study where they looked at appropriate versus inappropriate antibiotic dosing more than half of the people who got the appropriate antibiotic survived whereas only one tenth of the people who got an inappropriate antibiotic survived so obviously it was a powerful predictor of survival so again odds ratio look at that that's really creepily high uh, of course all the other things are there meaning dialysis copd immunosuppression all of them are independent risk factors but getting the most appropriate antibiotic is obviously very 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 critical and that cannot be understated as a risk okay and uh, hang on so uh, so let's look at some case scenarios and try and see how we can um, go further a 25 year old lady presents two weeks after marriage this is a patient i actually had uh, a couple of uh, about a year year and a half after i came back to india and started work here and uh, she presented she got married in the first week of june i think first of june or something a week after marriage she went to her primary care physician and uh, she reported burning mucurition so she was given an esoteric diagnosis of honeymoon cystitis and was started on ciprofloxacin honestly today ciprofloxacin does really nothing because chemo load resistance is very very high in the community about 80 90% of uh, bacteria uh, gram negatives in the community are cipro resistant and honestly if you really want cipro you can just have some chicken because chicken get far more cipro than we do so uh, it really won't achieve anything at all she Uh, took the cipro and now she developed fever chills and flank pain so obviously now she has a progression of symptoms from a lower urinary tract infection to upper urinary tract infection and when she came to the er she was tachypneic she was tachycardic she was shivering and we could clearly see that she was bacteremic and obviously the diagnosis is a complicated uti or a pyelonephritis with sepsis the primary physician had already sent off a urine culture at that time which had shown e coli which was resistant to a few antibiotics obviously cipro resistance is predictable but it is also resistant to one third genus cephalosporin uh, but uh, susceptible to many of the other uh, I mean, uh, organ uh, antibiotics that are available so the question here is what is the right drug to start so patients presenting from the community with complicated urinary tract infection is one of the common presentations in any major hospital irrespective of the kind of patient care that you are already providing uh so this is very very common especially in women men also get urinary tract infection when they start developing stones or prostate and things like that so this is not at all unusual and for a long time we were just taking a, a ladida approach in terms of taking pot shots or whichever antibiotic we could but over time since drug resistance has started becoming a problem we have realized that using the right drug makes a difference because not all of them work as well as possible So the first thing is about certain alphabets, uh, ESBL, extended spectrum beta lactams. Basically, these are enzymes that are produced by gram-negative bacteria, which will hydrolyze a lot of beta lactams. So uh, you have uh, ESBLs like uh, TEM, SHIV, and uh, CTXM, and things like that. Now, with CTXM, which is a very common uh, uh, ESBL, which has gone around the world, possibly from India, uh, it will. hydrolyze all the third genus cephalosporins and therefore you have to be careful the problem is less than 1% of the labs in india will actually tell you it's esbl they'll just tell you susceptible resistant and therefore you got to be careful so if you see a a drug susceptibility report in which the gram negative organism e coli klebsiella whatever it is is resistant to one third genus cephalosporin you have to assume that is resistant to all third generation cephalosporin because that would be considered as an esbl producer unless otherwise proved and for a long time we used either a beta lactam beta lactam as inhibitor like piperacillin tazobactam cefepirozin sulbactam or something like that or we just went for a carbapenem uh, 
but the question is which one should we use for a long time we believe both are valid and you could choose either of those but uh, in the recent past some of these things have been shaken up and we'll talk about it so first thing is that you have to understand that uh, the reporting pattern is hampered because there are no standard guidelines over here and therefore the clinician should also learn to identify espl by looking at the susceptibility pattern if you see one third not first generation second generation not cefazolin not cefiroxine ceftriaxone ceftazidine uh, cefaperazone ceftriaxone any of these things if any cefoxetin any of them are knocked off assume it's espl so uh, that's why if you look at third generation cefalosporins now uh, the breakpoints have been reduced by espl and uh, we now know that even if it says susceptible failures are very very common and therefore ceftriaxone is no longer considered the gold standard drug for this condition ceftriaxone is a great drug for pneumococcus it's a great drug for it's a reasonable drug for salmonella but it's not a very good drug for many of the other conditions a lot of people have been looking at cefepime and there's been a lot of push on cefepime saying it's a good drug cefepime is not a good drug for espl it has some benefit in ampsis but for esbl it really sucks so <clears throat> here again there was a problem because mic testing is not accurate and therefore your cefepime susceptibility which is reported by the lab is not reliable so do not look at cefepime susceptibility and think oh my god that's a great option it is not it just is not accurate so there was a study looking at cefepime for esbl infections and what they showed was clinical and microbiological failures was very high so therefore cefepime is not an alternative to ceftriaxone or ceftazidine it's just not an alternative at all so the point is uh, there is a problem here and we don't know what to do so the guidelines are not very clear and that's where the merino trial came in merino trial is looking at patients who had ceftriaxone resistant e coli eclepsiella bacteremia due to that so you have a patient in the ward or in the icu blood is growing e coli eclepsiella which is resistant to, resistant to ceftriaxone and they were randomized to either piperacillin tazobactam or meropenem they were hoping for equivalence they were hoping to show they were doing equally well but the problem was uh, the the uh, mortality in meropenem was far far lower than with piperacillin tazobactam so the problem was now they had a finding they did not expect and they had to conclude that meropenem is superior to piperacillin tazobactam so if you look at it meropenem mortality is under 4% whereas piperacillin tazobactam was at least three times as much at 12%. So therefore, you should know that the current recommendation for an ESBL producer in a sick patient would have to be a carbapenem, either imipenem or meropenem. And in this study, meropenem was tested. And of course, uh, you have to understand that uh, there are reasons why it, uh, uh, it, it failed. And this is important. A lot of people ask me, what about the MIC? Now, knowing the MIC made no difference. The failure rate did not depend on the MIC to piperacillin tazobactam. It did not matter whether the MIC was low or high. The failure rate was the same. So please keep in mind that looking at MIC does not make sense. I know people make a lot of deal about MIC and there are situations where MIC is important. If you're treating uh, MRSA, you want to know the Vancouver MIC and MIC. If you're treating pneumococcus, you want to know the penicillin MIC. If you're treating streptococcus, you want to know the penicillin MIC. If you're using colistin, you need to know the colistin MIC. But outside of that, routinely looking at my MIC is not very smart. It just makes no difference. So again, that's why if you look at the current IDSA guideline, if you have a complicated urinary tract with an ESBL producer, the recommendation is for a type 2 carbapenem for a sick patient. And for a non-sick patient, you can go for a type 1 carbapenem. What is a type 1 carbapenem? Ertapenem. What is a type 2 carbapenem? Imipenem and meropenem. Kinolones in our country don't make sense because of the resistance. Cotrimoxazole is absolutely fantastic. Uh, you, most people would feel uncomfortable using cotrimoxazole in an ICU patient. But for non-ICU patients, cotrimoxazole is not a bad choice at all. The idea is to minimize the carbapenem use by prioritizing only the sick patients here. What about phosphomycin? Phosphomycin sucks because it has very poor blood levels. It's not a good choice. So also nitroferentoin. So uh, phosphomycin and nitroferentoin only for cystitis, uncomplicated cystitis in young women. It's not meant for anybody else. So do not use those drugs. So what about non-urinary infections? What about infections from outside the urinary tract? So obviously, again, uh, let's not forget that. Sorry, uh, in this again, uh, aminoglycosides are also good choices. If it is from a non-urinary focus, 
If you have an ESPL producer from the lung or from intra-abdominal focus, then again, based on the Merino trial, the preference is for a carbapenem, like imipenem or perapenem. You can downsize to something like cotrimoxone after four things have been achieved. Number one, you have confirmed that it's susceptible. Two, the patient is better. Three, the source control is achieved. And four, the patient can tolerate orally. So in that case, cotrimoxone is a good choice. Do not use drugs like amoxiclav, doxycycline, nitrofurantoin, or phosphomycin because they have very poor levels in the blood and they are not good choice for this kind of situation. So if you have an ESBL from the intra-abdominal area or from the lung, do not use these kind of agents at all. You are better off using uh, something like uh, trimethoprim casarphomethoxazole. What about piptazo? Uh, if you are a sick patient upfront, piptazo or sulfurazin sulbactam is not a good drug. However, if you have already started piptazo or sulfurazin sulbactam and the patient is improving, then you just leave it alone. But empirically, upfront for a sick patient, it would not be a good choice. Uh, our practice is that if the patient is stable, low risk patient, like for example, it's not a cancer patient, it's not a transplant recipient, it's not a pregnant woman, there's no structural abnormality, there's no obstruction, it's not neutropenia, uh, and the patient is stable, no sepsis, septic shock, patient is in the ward, all of those get checked off. Then we may choose, we often choose beta lactam, beta lactam is inhibitor in higher doses. But if the patient has any of the risk factors that I just talked about, or if the patient is ICU, our standard go-to drug would be acabapenem. But however, if you're using piperacil and tazobactam, you should know that the dosing for piperacil and tazobactam in ESBL is four times daily, not three times daily. So for a regular infection, piperacil and tazobactam is 4.5 grams Q6, Q8H, but for ESBL and for pseudomonas, the recommendation is 4.5 grams Q6H or four times daily. You cannot use it three times daily for ESPL. That's just a bad idea. You have to use it four times daily. So that much is now clear. So the recommendation is fairly clear in terms of what is the drug of choice for ESPL producing community acquired sepsis. This is a 63 year old lady with a chronic lymphedema and she presents with a red tender swelling of the leg with fevers and rigors. As you can see, the whole place is red, shiny, swollen, and obviously very, very inflamed. She's tachycardic, she's slightly hypotense. What is the best option here? Uh, you have sepharacin, sulbactam, meropenem, vancomycin, amoxiclap. The point is that uh, I have seen this and many other drugs being used. The answer is we need to know what are the first or causative organisms in this kind of setting. And it's very easy. The causative organisms are usually staphylococci and streptococci. How do you differentiate between staphylococcal sepsis and streptococcal sepsis? Staphylococcal sepsis generally form pustules and uh, it's usually not a uniform uh, lesion like this with a clear demarcation. This is more of a streptococcal cellulitis. And in this case, streptococcal cellulitis is always penicillin susceptible. So you can start on vancomycin if you're worried about staph. So when do we start with an MRSA coverage? If, the patient, if this patient was in the ICU, I would have started on vancomycin. But these days I have moved to another agent, uh, vancomycin or ticoplan for that matter. But these days I've moved to another agent called septorolin which gives me very good MSSA, MRSA, and streptococcal coverage. Uh, but you, you cannot be faulted for using Vanco or Pico. But if the patient is stable in the ward, then I don't routinely use this MS, MRSA coverage. I just go for MSSA coverage uh, with, uh, say, yeah, I would even choose something like septrioxone here because it will cover my streptococci very, very nicely. So in this case, supposing I grow staph aureus and it grows MSSA, uh, she's already been started on vancomycin and she's doing well. What should we do? Should we continue vancomycin? Should we continue my vancomycin and repeat culture? Should we switch to cefazolin or should we switch to cefazolin and repeat culture? So there are two points here. Number one, for staph or is bacteremia, it is important to repeat cultures because the duration of bacteremia determines outcomes. Studies have shown that if a person is having prolonged bacteremia with staph, they have a higher risk of mortality and a higher risk of seeding in many different places and you have to look a lot harder. So it's important, just like candida, to get negative cultures in staph aureus as well. So that's number one. Number two, for MSSA, vancomycin is associated with higher mortality as compared to something like cefazolin or flucloxacillin. Uh, if it was endocarditis, I would probably be a little worried about using cefazolin. I'd probably go for a penicillin-based drug like flucloxacillin. But for skin and soft tissue infection, I'm actually very happy using cefazolin. So the answer here would be, you have to switch to cefazolin because that reduces mortality. And B, you have to also repeat cultures 
because that has also been shown to impact prognosis. So both of these are important. And for staff orders, it's important to know that repeat cultures are recommended. So uh, just to summarize, staph and strep are very common as skin and soft tissue infections, even in diabetics. Streptococci, all beta lactams are effective. Vancomycin, lindamycin, or adaptomycin are also effective, but your beta lactams are always the best. For staphylococci, if it's MSSA, go for cloxacillin or 2-cloxacillin or whatever that is, or cefazolin. If it's MRSA, you can go for vancomycin, picoplanin, or adaptomycin. And now we have another drug called sephirolin, which is what we are using for many of the situations now. Uh, where do BLBLIs and carbapenems fit? They just don't. You don't have E. coli and Klebsiella over here. So you really do not need merapenem. You do not need pepercillin tazobactam. You do not need sephirozin sulbactam. And I unfortunately see a lot of drugs like that being unnecessarily wasted in these kind of situations. And they re give rise to unnecessary problems going forward. So again, uh, very often it's because we don't understand the microbiology of these kind of infections that mistakes happen. When do we see gram negatives? If you have a penetrating foot injury, penetrating injury, yes, gram negatives can happen. If you have inoculational injury, if it is a diabetic foot ulcer, I'm not talking about cellulitis, <coughs> diabetic foot ulcer, yes, uh, diabetic with inner ear infection, yes. So those kind of specific situations, you will see uh, somebody with water-related injury, yes, gram negatives. But outside of that, Simple skin and soft tissue infection is always step and step and staff and step and gram negatives are not a major problem. Again, not all uh, skin and soft tissue infections are created equal. This was a patient that we had a few years ago, uh, international patient who had a, a liver transplant uh, about five weeks ago. Uh, he was doing well. He had been discharged. He was on fo follow up in the outpatient. <clears throat> waiting to go back to his country, uh, basically because we keep them here for about two months after transplant one is gluteus, for which the primary team gave us to augment it. And that kind of seemed to be settling. And now he had this lesion here. And as, as always, it comes here on a Friday evening. So my colleague, uh, my surgical colleague who saw this, a very smart cookie, he had a look at it and said, Dr. Subra, what do you want to do? So the question is, do we, what do we give him? Do we give him, uh, take some swabs and send him home? Should we give him clindamycin, leofloxin, merapenem, or should we call infectious disease? Well, the answer is, like we say, the answer is always call E infection diseases. The issue is that, again, in an immunosuppressed patient, these rules do not apply. This patient had an immediate biopsy because my surgeon friend actually went ahead, took off the SCAR, took a biopsy, and did a and quickly got a frozen. It turned out to be an invasive fungal infection because he had scratched himself and inoculated a fungus. <clears throat> and uh, he immediately had uh, local excision over there. And fortunately, we were able to catch it very early, and the patient did very well in spite of it being mucormycosis. So, Please understand that uh, although skin and soft tissue infections are fairly common due to staph and strep, we have to be careful in extremely immunosuppressed people, like say neutropenic patients. They are not the same and obviously the microbiology there varies. So please keep in mind that regular people may, uh, rules may not apply in the profoundly immunosuppressed. And I'm not talking about vent control diabetic. They are not profoundly immunosuppressed. And whenever you have this, always take tissue to find out what's happening. And then we have this patient, a 68-year-old gentleman who had been in my hospital for bile duct cancer. He's got fever and chills. He's already had a stent placed because he had, uh, you know, biliary tube blocking. And now it again seems to be blocked and he's gone into fever and chills, which seems to be cholangitis. The blood culture now grows plebsilla pneumonia. And as you can see, it seems to be resistant to a lot of different antibiotics. The question is, what is to be used? It's susceptible to tegecycline, amikacin, meropenem, imipenem, gentamicin, and cholesterol. Most people would have gone for a tabapenem, but that would be a mistake because <clears throat> ertapenem is considered the indicator antibiotic. It's important for all labs to report ertapenem susceptibility for enterobacteriaceae. Again, ertapenem will not work for uh, Pseudomonas and Acinetobacter, but for E. coli and Klebsiella, you have to ask the lab to report ertapenem. Why? Because if it is ertapenem resistant, it doesn't matter what they say about imipenem and meropenem, they will not work. It is a carbapenem resistant organism. There is an inducible carbapenemase, and imipenem meropenem will not work. The patient will fail. So it's important to look at ertapenem. And once you see that, you realize mero and imi are bad choices. What about amikacin and gentamicin? While they're great drugs for Klebsiella, they are terrible drugs for biliary system. TG cyclin could be an option. Cholestin could be an option, but those would be the answer. 
And that's where the newer BLBLIs came in because the problem is for a long time, we didn't have any great antibiotics. And with colistin, the problems were initially it worked very well. But as the MIC started rising, colistin uh, non resting better. And that's where we started. Okay. And that's where we started using the newer agents like Cephazidim Avibactam. And uh, when they looked at uh, <coughs> carbapenem producing and Clepsilla pneumonia, Bacteremia, uh, Cephazidim Avibactam based therapy had much higher survival rate. And uh, this is actually 30 day survival. Uh, as you can see with uh, colistin based therapy, survival is 40%. And with Cephazidim Avibactam, it was 85%. So obviously, it makes a difference about which antibiotic you use. And Cephazidim Avibactam has become superior to colistin based therapy. And it is independently associated with success in the, in the situation of Clepsilla pneumonia bacteremia. This was a very beautiful study done by a data set from Vanduvid. And they looked at what happens in patients who, are, who receive colistin based therapy versus Ceftazidim bacterium based therapy. On the left is Ceftaz AV, on the right is colistin. And the black bars is mortality. As you can see, the pro proportion of people who died in the hospital is much higher with colistin. And the lightest bar at the bottom is people going home. As you can see, people are more likely to go home if they have septicemia bacterium as compared to colistin. So colistin is not a great drug, and that's why there's been a lot of de-emphasis on the use of colistin in uh, intrabacteriaceae. So this was another study looking at hematological malignancies, and I'll quickly summarize what it said. What it showed was that, uh, I'm sorry, the graph stone project well. As you can see, this is septicemia AV, and this is alternative therapy. And septicemia AV-based therapy had a much higher... Um, uh, Septa's AV had a much higher, uh, as you can see this, uh, clinical and survival. As you can see, Septa's AV had a much higher clinical survival and uh, cure rates as compared to the comparator antibiotic. And I think that is really telling. Even in the most vulnerable, Septa's AV based therapy did much better than comparator therapy, which was colistin based therapy. So uh, that's why a lot of studies have been done, study after study, which has shown that septicemia AV bacterium is now preferable. And if you look at mortality, uh, having a septicemia AV bacterium based uh, regimen clearly has a mortality benefit. So the top line is survival with septicemia AV, and the top, bottom line is septicemia uh, survival when septicemia AV was not uh, used. So obviously, uh, that is an independent predictor of survival. So a lot of patient, uh, people have moved to septicemia AV based therapy instead of colistin based therapy for carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae, and that is what our practice is. In fact, we use it empirically because we do not have acinetobacter in our hospital. So for us, it's all Clepsilla pneumonia, and for that, there's no question of which is better. And uh, it's an independent predictor, as you can see. This any regimen having septicemia AV is a separate, uh, uh, you know, is a is a protective factor when it comes to mortality in the setting of Clepsilla pneumonia. <laughs> So again, that's why if you look at the IDSA guidelines right now, if you have a urinary, even for a urinary tract infection, where colistin is got very good concentrations in the urinary tract, uh, they have clearly mentioned that the newer BLBLI, in this case, septaz AV, is superior to colistin-based therapy, and they recommend the newer BLBLI. In our case, it will be septaz AV, and we should not be using septaz AV separately. We have to use it with astronomy because of it, it cover uh, uh, metallomital actinases like butyl metallomital actinase. Cephidorocol uh, is in the wings, but it has higher bacteremia and is no longer an option. One state aminoglycosides, if it's susceptible, is an excellent option. Aminoglycosides are awesome when it comes to urinary tract infection. There's absolutely nothing wrong. You cannot use phosphomycin and nitrofurantoin. So this is the recommendation that uh, we usually say. It's as AV with astronam in our kind of setting where we have MBLs. And if you look at retrospective data that's come from Greece and even from Italy, they have shown that septaz AV with astronam has a survival benefit over other forms of therapy, including colistin-based therapy. For intra-abdominal infections, we can go for high-dose digicycline. Eravacycline is not available, but you go for higher-dose digicycline, which is 200 milligrams loading and 100 milligrams twice daily, which is reasonable. But for your sickest patient, it just is very, very clear. <clears throat> So for non-urinary focus, whether it's the lung, whether it's the abdomen, septas AV with astronam is what is uh, recommended. If you can do a, a CARBA-R test and show the mechanism of carbapenem resistance, and if it's only OXO48, then septas AV is fine. But if you're not sure, or if there is an MBL with it, you need both septas AV and astronam. Can you use astronam alone if it's an MBL? The answer is no, because you don't have MBLs alone. They'll usually be an ESBL or an AMC, which will kill the astronam. What we need is astronam AV bacterium. 
So giving SEPTA as AB with astronym is the answer. You cannot use astronym separately. So what is the role of polymixins in, in CRE? The answer is it is best avoided. Cholestin is a last resort for cystitis. This is very, very telling. And this is the idea of the guideline. So it's no longer considered a great drug. And uh, the clinical efficacy of the polymixins is falling. And also testing of uh, polymixin susceptibility is a problem. Very few places do uh, broth microdilution for polymixins. And therefore, you really don't know. I would suggest to all of you check with your own labs to do check if they are doing broth microdilution susceptibility. If they are not doing broth microdilution, then the polymixin susceptibility that you are getting is actually not correct at all. It basically is garbage. If they say it's resistant, it's definitely resistant. But if they say it's susceptible, it means nothing. It could be very well be resistant. And therefore, <clears throat> the recommendation is that you have to be careful when you look at uh, cholestin and polymixin use. And uh, it's probably not a best idea to use these in CRE. Should we use combination therapy? I'm not talking about septize AV with astronym. The question is septize AV with astronym with say an aminoglycoside with cholestin. The answer is no, you do not need combinations. So put it very uh, bluntly, in terms of CRE, uh, septa AB with astronym is the preferred option today. Cholestin could be considered an alternative for urinary tract infection, but not the preferred agent. Um, amikacin is an awesome drug. There's nothing wrong for it for urinary tract infection. And for intra-abdominal infection, where tigicycline susceptibility is pretty decent, you can use high-dose tigicycline. Finally, let's say this is a 38-year-old pancreatic patient with pancreatitis admitted to a hospital in the ICU for 12 days. He's been on meropenem. He has a femoral line, and now he's developed septic shock with renal failure. And uh, they've removed the femoral line, and empiric antibiotics need to be started. And in this hospital, if you look at it, this is the antibiogram that they say. They have uh, the acinetobacter, they have E. coli, they have Klebsiella and Pseudomonas in the ICU. And as you can see, carbapenem susceptibility is not very great. For Klebsiella, resistance is 75%, acinetobacter is 70%. So obviously, carbapenem resistance is very, very high, and acinetobacter is a big player. So you cannot use septa as AV. You have to use a polymixin-based therapy. So if you have carbapenem resistant acinetobacter bomani is a problem, uh, you have to be careful. For mild infections, a uh, patient is absolutely stable, there are no high risk factors, yada, 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 then you can get away with a single agent. Uh, ampicillin sulbactam is the preferred agent over there. We can use, ampicillin has no role. You can go for high dose sulbactam over here. But if the patient is sick in any way, moderate or even severe, you have to use combination therapy with at least two preferably three agents, and we'll talk about that. What is the role of sulbactam? High-dose sulbactam is a good idea, and uh, ampicillin is what is used in the Western world. Here, uh, sulbactam alone is available. There are people who use ceftriaxone, sulbactam, EDTA as the sulbactam donor in some, situ in some hospitals, and they tell me that they have very good response with that. I personally have no uh, experience with this because, like I said, I don't have acinetobacter in my hospital, and therefore, our experience of acinetobacter is very, very minimal, if at all. Uh, but yes, uh, you can use uh, sulbactam sulbactam EDTA as an option for the sulbactam delivery. Uh, but you do need the sulbactam, but it cannot be that alone. You do need a polymixin. Polymixin B is considered the preferred agent for this. Cholestin would be the preferred agent if it's urinary tract. Non-urinary tract, poly B is considered better. Uh, poly B monotherapy is fine for mild, but if you have moderate to severe, you have to use combination of poly B plus uh, a sulbactam donor plus maybe a tetracycline. And uh, the preferred tetracycline here are actually minocycline because we have longer experience and we have better breakpoints as per CLSI. Uh, if you can't get Mino or you're not able to use Mino, high dose Mino, then one option is to go for high dose Tigicycline. So uh, if you look at CRAB, uh, we'll come to that. So what about extended use infusion of meropenem? Again, you can try it. The problem is it doesn't make sense because the MICs to meropenem are so high. Even if you do extended dosing meropenem uh, infusion, and remember, meropenem is an unstable drug. You cannot continue infusion for more than three hours. It is unstable beyond that. It doesn't really make sense. So carbapenems are no longer a part of astrotobacter bombani treatment because of the resistance profile. Uh, rifamycins also have activity. It was initially very, very exciting. But if you look at it, they cause more uh, side effects and uh, renal failure and things like that. And therefore, it is no longer recommended as part of CRAB treatment. What about nebulized antibiotics? Nebulized antibiotics are no longer recommended for any situation 
both by the IDSA guideline and both the ECMED guideline. And therefore, it's not something that we use in our hospital. So if you're treating CRAP, the recommendation is to use polyvixins at appropriate doses. There's no point doing homeopathic treatment. If you're going to do it, might as well be all in. Uh, like I keep saying, more patients die of septic shock than due to antibiotic side effects. Antibiotic side effects rarely kill people. Septic shock routinely kill people. So do not be miserly in dosing your antibiotic. Be generous and hit hard because there's no point talking about side effect unless the patient is alive. So uh, please keep that in mind. So polymixin with minocycline preferred over tigicycline, sulbactam in some form, and you need combination therapy for most patients, except the mild, everybody needs combination. So it's probably a combination of these three that makes sense. <clears throat> so when we're choosing an antibiotic, how do we know? The first thing is a diagnosis. I keep telling my, uh, my team this, you know, put down a diagnosis. It doesn't matter. It could be right, it could be wrong. But unless you put a diagnosis down, you're never going to be right. It's okay to revise your diagnosis. You're putting down a possible clinical diagnosis. And without knowing what you're treating, you don't know what you're treating either. Uh, also assess who the host is. Because obviously, like I said, if it's a neutropenic host and things like that, it's going to be very different. And unless you know your host, you do not know your microbiology. And you have to know what are the usual organisms which cause that kind of a uh, drug infection profile. And once we know the organisms, then you look at the risk of drug resistance. What, uh, what is the risk of drug resistance in your neck of the woods? What is your hospital antibiogram, both for community acquired organisms and for hospital infections? See, uh, very often I see hospital antibiograms which say, Klebsiella, carboparam susceptibility 50%. No Klebsiella is 50% susceptible. See, Klebsiella, which comes to the community, 99% is carboparam susceptible. On the other hand, nosocomial Klebsiella is 99% carboparam resistant. So it's not the same. So having Klebsiella, which is 50% susceptible, does not help you. You need to have splits like that. So community acquired Klebsiella, what is the susceptibility? Hospital Klebsiella, what is the susceptibility? Once you have that E. coli and Klebsiella, you know. So if you have 50% susceptibility to Klebsiella, you'd be thinking maybe for my community acquired sepsis, Merapenem is a bad choice. The answer is no. It is 99% carbapenem susceptible and Merapenem is an awesome choice. On the other hand, in the ICU, your carbapenem susceptibility is probably about 15-20%, in which case Merapenem is a sucky, sucky choice. You have to go for something else. So you have to know what the microbiology is. So uh, what agent is best suited for the problem? So what is true for... Uh, Pyelonephritis is not true for a pneumonia. So choose the drug based on the penetration and the toxicity. Toxicity should be the last concern, penetration. There's only one contraindication for aminoglycoside. I'll see if somebody can put the correct answer in the chat box or be willing to stick the neck out and tell me what is the only contraindication to using aminoglycosides. And of course, you want to use the right dose. And that's something which keeps up coming again and again. I see underdosing as a rampant problem. And that's something you want to avoid. Uh, you can have a clinical pharmacology service to help you. I have a clinical pharmacy service which helps with this. So, for example, for many, many years, for the last eight years, we've had that. So, if I wanted cholestin based therapy, all I have to do is write cholestin based therapy and the second day in this XYZ. And my clinical pharmacy service will roll in and they'll take care of the loading dose and the regular dose and things like that. See, as uh, intensivists, your job is not to try and calculate the drug dosing. Your job should be to figure out what the diagnosis is and what the treatment plan is. Let pharmacy take care of the dosing. Why should you worry about that? It doesn't make sense. It's not an effective use of your time. Let somebody else do that. The idea is to offshore it. I mean, you don't certainly do uh, respiratory therapy. You don't certainly do uh, you know, nursing care. Why should you be doing this? Offshore it to other people who can do it better. And let's focus on what our core strengths are. That's what is most ideal in terms of patient safety and outcomes. Another point about blood culture, you want to get adequate amounts of blood in, you want to get two cultures and you want at least 40 ml of blood. Everybody, all adults have about 5 liters of blood, nobody dies of losing 40 ml, so please do not be stingy. You want to get blood cultures done properly and if you get blood cultures properly, your outcomes are better. It's an independent predictor of survival from septic shock. <coughs> Again, clean the skin properly with the floor accident, make sure that they are trained on this aseptic techniques, get at least two cultures with 10 ml in each bottle and each ml uh, increases the recovery rate by about 1.25%. One ml increases your recovery rate by 1.25%. And there's no reason to get RTV cultures, venous cultures are fine. Say two separate bricks, 20 ml from each brick, two, two bottles, 10 ml in each and send it off to microbiology. 
and make sure that your skin contamination rates are low. The recommended skin contamination rate should be less than 3%. Our hospital, we have always been under 0.5%. And that's something we are exceedingly proud of because this is something we keep an eye because as contamination rate grows up, your positivity rate also goes down because we are, you know, if skin contaminant grows up, if there's a clamp growing behind it, you will not identify it. If there's an E. coli growing behind it, you will not identify it. So please make sure that they take the sample properly. Otherwise, you will miss the candida or the E. coli or the Klebsiella or Acinetobacter or whatever it is, which will grow behind it and therefore you will miss it. So uh, people keep asking me, where do they put the swab stick? The best thing is the dustbin. Uh, never take swabs. If there is pus, aspirate it in a syringe and send the syringe. Swabs are terrible. You want to see the gram stain and swabs really, you can't get good, uh, good gram stain and culture. Swabs and the, and the culture syringe, on the other hand, is less contaminated and has more sample and can tell you a lot more information. If you have tissue, debride deep tissue and send that for culture. Do not take swabs. Swabs are useless. They are unhelpful. Do not routinely culture sputum and urine. Uh, they, save no, they serve absolutely no purpose other than unnecessary antibiotic use and make the patient's life and your life hell. Routine cultures are a bad idea. And you can do serologies in selected patients in, in trying to find out what is happening. <clears throat> Again, there are barriers in getting to all of this. One is the diagnostic uncertainty because all said and done, there are so many tests today and not all tests are perfect. Uh, just because a PCR machine spits out something doesn't mean it is, uh, uh, you know, gospel truth. You need to Id uh, identify how to interpret all these PCR tests and you have to be very, very careful. I know people get enamored by these PCR tests, but they have uh, limitations and that's something people for often forget. Also understand that negative culture reports are fairly common and there you're left to rely on your clinical acumen and also finally it's your confidence in your clinical skills and what you're facing that makes a big difference. So the general principles is one, make a diagnosis. It's important to make sure that you have appropriate therapy, limit temporary therapy because that just makes life a little more miserable. Uh, understand the difference between colonization and contamination versus true infection. So not all urine cultures need treatment. In fact, 99% of urine cultures don't need treatment. Uh, use antibiotics effectively. Optimize your PKPD parameters. Make sure you have a loading dose. Uh, use uh, long infusions for beta lactams. Not, not all beta lactams can be used continuously. Like ceftazidimibactam, the recommendation is for three hours. Meropenem is three hours. Fibrocellitazobactam can go over 24 hours. And also look at combinations. Like if you're using a polymixin, always use it with a second agent like uh, phosphomycin or whatever it is, depending on the clinical situation. If you're using Fascinatobacter, obviously, we know RTG and a sulbactam donor. And always, always think of de-escalation. That's an area where we don't talk about. Our hospital de-escalation rates are about 75%, which I'm personally proud of. And studies have shown that patients where de-escalation is done, outcomes are better. So de-escalate as quickly as possible and stop antibiotics whenever possible. There are very few situations where we need more than seven, five to seven days of therapy and understand that giving longer duration of uh, antibiotics actually is counterproductive. Do not uh, routinely treat ET aspirate, treat the VAP. If, do not pre send the, cardio, the central line catheter tips. The best, uh, if, if somebody wants to know where to put the tip, I would suggest the dustbin. Do not send it to microbiology lab. We don't need it. Uh, again, treat the line infection and treat the blood culture. And again, if you have a CBD, uh, if you have a Foley catheter, you will have bacteria, you will have pyuria. It's a foreign body, it will elicit uh, white cells. So finding white cells or finding bacteria does not mean it's a UTI. Treat only if they're symptomatic palinopritis. And of course, also remember there are lots of septic mimics like pancreatitis, heat stroke, drug hypersensitivity, falciparum malaria. There are a lot of things which look like sepsis, or bacterial sepsis, but they are not. They have nothing to do with their bacterial infections and therefore antibiotics have very little role. Uh, there are lots of uh, guidelines like this on how to uh, go about de-escalating. On day three, you have to reevaluate, look at the patient, look at the parameters and see how you can come down or stop antibiotics because that is absolutely, absolutely critical. So the current recommendation is to start, start smart and then focus. Make sure you start, start with the right drug at the right dose, at the right time, at the right duration. See, the problem is too, too, too two-faced. At the upfront phase, we don't start high enough, we don't start with the right drug, and we don't start on time. And at the back end, we keep continuing for unnecessary duration. We are unnecessarily escalating, we are not de-escalating, and there's a lot of problems with that. So it's important to look at all of this and have a uh, 
a guideline based decision to improve outcomes so to conclude there are no magic bullets hmm. robert button said it's vain to speak of cures or think of remedies until such time as we have considered of the causes cures must uh, must be imperfect lame and to no purpose wherein the cause have not been first first been searched so basically try and find out what is happening because if you don't know what's happening the cure is unlikely to work and uh, you know whenever i see a treatment not working i keep telling my team this there are three pillars the first pillar is is your diagnosis right you cannot move forward unless that pillar is firm if the diagnosis is right the next question is is your treatment correct in terms of the drug the dosing the regimen everything i i you know pkpd all that stuff if that is fine the third question is is there a complication which is ascribable to the primary problem itself as they develop an abscess or something like that so you have to go in order you can't start with pillar 3 before you finish pillar 1 pillar 1 if that is clear pillar 2 if that is clear go to pillar 3 and very often less is more and more and more studies are showing that so i will stop here and uh, let's see if we have questions thank you thank you sir for a very nice and uh, good talk one question has come up uh, he, he wants to know about acetonal bacterial meningitis dr soran anand and also about uh, the role of uh, intrathecal antibiotics for cre okay so that's a problem isn't it so for um, meningitis it's a little complicated because uh, beta lactam beta lactam inhibitors are no good beta lactam inhibitors are the problem see uh, Pepperacillin tays a bacter. Pepperacillin will enter. Tays a bacter will not enter. Cefepirazon sulf bacter. Cefepirazon will enter. Sulf bacter will not enter. Same way, AV bacter also will not enter the CNO. Therefore, for meningeal infections, these things cannot be used at all. You have to rely on good old-fashioned uh, drugs which we have for a very long time, which include polymyxins and things like that. So, uh, if you have polymyxin-based therapy as an option, you have to use systemic and intrathecal therapy. the recommendation is to use polymyxin b and not colistin why because if you give it intrathecally uh, supposing you have an evd it has to stay inside for some time colistin has to be converted to that to molecule and therefore it takes longer for it to work and very often what happens is it comes you open the uh, evd out and therefore it has had no time to work so always use polymyxin if you are using intrathecal therapy do not use colistin for intrathecal second uh, aminoglycosides are actually awesome if it is aminoglycosides susceptible uh, amikacin is a lovely drug but please look at our pharmacy to look at it and see if the preparation of aminoglycoside that you are receiving is appropriate for intrathecal use you cannot shove anything and everything into the cns you will end up with a terrible terrible chemical meningitis which will be far worse than the bacterial meningitis you do not want to lose a patient to chemical meningitis so make sure that the formulation of uh, drug that you get is appropriate for that we have an internal process to ensure that all of this is taken care of again clinical pharmacy does that for us and if you need help my clinical pharmacist is more than help with that that's not a problem but uh, again uh, i mean I, i remember during my pg days back in the 90s uh, i remember i had a patient with a post neurosurgical pseudomonas meningitis and the patient could not afford tabapenems at that time we i did alternate day lumbar puncture and kept giving him intrathecal amikacin seven doses of amikacin over two weeks time the guy was completely cured and he went home fine so that was eye opening for me and i converted me into a great fan of aminoglycoside i'm still not seeing anybody type the only contraindication for aminoglycoside i'm waiting to see if somebody can get that right uh, uh, yes. i can answer that i think it would be neuromuscular disease you are not allowed to answer dog <laughs> but <laughs> Yes, that's answer. not fair. But that's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. The only contraindication is neuromuscular disease like myasthenia gravis and uh, Eaton-Lambert syndrome. And you are, very often people tell me it's renal failure. Renal failure is not a contraindication. So, uh, but yes, you can use it. You have to use intrathecal antibiotics if it's carbapenem-resistant bacteria, and it has to be intrathecal with systemic therapy. It cannot be independent. And obviously, you have to monitor the function. meaning you have to uh, repeat cultures to make sure that it's sterilizing and things are working out uh, but it's tricky yes thank you sir for the nice answer another question uh, what is the role of levonadi floxacin in mrsa uh, i'm hearing a lot about this it's a nice agent for a couple of reasons one you have both iv and oral so you can switch from iv to oral very very easily two uh, it has very good tissue penetration because it's a chemolone 
and obviously tissue penetration is awesome three it does not seem to interfere much with uh, tuberculosis which i am always worried about because i don't want phenolone use because i want to keep it for my drug resistant tb and this does not seem to make a problem with that from what we can see so yes there are some advantages with that it could be an alternative for certain forms where you see mrsa for example skin and soft tissue infection you can consider levonorgestrel uh you can consider it for other situations where you see uh like uh, even osteomyelitis and things like that you could consider levonorgestrel where mrsa is a significant concern right so sir, one or two questions from my side sir so in renal failure sir the dose of meropenem let's say can be 2 gram tds or only the first dose should be 2 gram like what kind of a... okay very good question thank you for that so the first dose is always 2 grams but when you say renal failure it's also contingent on understanding whether it's acute renal dysfunction or chronic renal failure all the dosing is worked out for stable chronic renal failure which is long standing most of the patients that you see in the icu are either acute renal dysfunction or acute or chronic renal failure and that's a problem because acute renal failure is not the same as chronic renal failure and remember although the creatinine can be slightly elevated you actually have hyperfiltration going on in which case you are massively underdosing the antibiotic so my rule of thumb is i always round up i do not round down i always round up whether i'm using gancyclovir whether i'm using meropenem whether i'm using colistin whether i'm using whatever drug i always round up to the next slab when it comes to the antimicrobial it's important to do this because if it's stable crf you go exactly by the creatinine if it is acute renal failure uh, my pharmacy service actually has a algorithm by which we look at not just the creatinine clearance but we also look at the urine output and we actually make a dynamic calculation based on how much it should be uh, so please understand let us say you have a patient in septic shock and the creatinine baseline was 0.9 now it is 3 but the guy is actually pouring out 1 1 liter uh, uh, sorry 100 ml every hour he is pouring out close to 2 and 1/2 liters a day of urine this guy is actually hyperfiltrating his creatinine of 3 is bs so this guy we would be a little more generous than we would normally dose for a creatinine of 3 so please be very, a little generous not too generous but slightly generous when you have acute renal dysfunction especially in the recovery phase so if the person has acute renal dysfunction and they are they are filtering well and you know things are going faster be a little more generous is what i would say as a rule of thumb unfortunately there are no standard guidelines here a lot of it is based on our own experience and things like that right sir thank you so then uh, uh, so if you are getting sensitive to phosphomycin or tdc cycling let's say phosphomycin in uti or tdc cycling intra abdominal infections and the patient is bad you know multi organ failure or septic shock can you them if you have sensitivity to phosphomycin or tdc cycling and the patient is in septic shock or multi organ failure because generally we do not uh, use them uh, alone you know yeah Phosphomycin is a bad choice. Phosphomycin has very poor drug levels. See, the thing is, for cystitis, the dose of phosphomycin in the outpatient is three grams, one dose. But here, you are talking about a humongous dose of phosphomycin. You need to give that much, like twenty-four grams at least, to keep the blood levels up. So please understand, phosphomycin is a sucky, sucky drug for bloodstream infection and for tissue infection because it gets filtered out very, very quickly into the urinary stream. Therefore, getting phosphomycin to do its work in the bloodstream or in the body is an extremely difficult problem, and therefore it's not a great choice. I've always had this problem with the IV phosphomycin. I kind of stay away from it. Tetracycline, especially in high dose, is a reasonable option for intra-abdominal infections. But if I have the situation of a patient who is in septic shock, I'm a little uncomfortable using tetracycline. I go back to using the newer BLBLI, uh, like ceftaz AB with astronam, to me because it's far superior. uh in terms of outcomes a mortality benefit is there survival benefit is huge so i go for that and then what i do is in 48 hours once the patient is stable and i have the organism and it tells it tells me it's tg susceptible i switch to high dose tg i don't go for high dose tg upfront if the patient is stable let's say i have a patient who's got a, a cholangitis and uh, they put on a biliary stent and the patient is still stable <coughs> there i would use the high dose uh, tg cycling on the other hand if i have a unstable patient or a high risk patient i am not comfortable using high dose tg i go for ceftaz ab with astrinam and of course metronidazole because for you need a anaerobic cover and once the patient is stable and you have source control and things like that i switch over to high dose tg right so thank you so then one final question sir not related to antibiotics and antivirals the dosing of a centamivir 
No, it's the recommended dose is 75 BD, but people often use 150 BD. So it can be. Yeah, yeah. So you can use 150 BD in sick patients. Uh, this is based on some, uh, let's say, mostly expert opinion rather than clinical trial data. Uh, there is some data to say that even a little later into the disease, especially for sick patient, oseltamivir may have some benefit. Remember, the best benefit of oseltamivir is within 48 hours of onset of illness, within two days. That's where you have your real big window of opportunity. If you give it within 20, uh, two days, it reduces the risk of uh, you know progression and things like that. And also shortens the illness, that's clear. Beyond that, the benefit is probably less so. But it's okay to give 150 BD in any stage simply because we know that the, some of these patients continue to have viral replication, making things worse and worse. So it does make sense giving over even in severe patients because you want to reduce viral replication and prevent more ongoing damage. So yes, it makes sense. I, we do use 150 BD for our sick patients. For our non-sick patients, we only use 75 BD. Thank you, sir. So no I think uh, there are, there's one more question, sir. Duration of treatment for gram-negative meningitis, three weeks or two weeks? Professor, the neurointensive study. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, that's a tough question. See, again, uh, the point is, is it, whether you're talking about intrathecal or systemic. So systemic therapy has to be three weeks. That we can't do anything. And you need to have negative cultures. See, it's not like pneumococcal meningitis, where routine uh, CSF cultures are not required. For drug resistant pneumococcal meningitis, you have to repeat a culture. Gram negative meningitis, you have to repeat a culture. You have to ensure that it's working. So please make sure when you're do, doing intrathecal therapy, also take samples out and look at everything, not just that the cultures are negative, but also your sugar should be rising. If your sugars are rising and the cultures have become negative, it means you're on the right track. Systemic therapy has to be three weeks. Intrathecal therapy, that's where you have a little bit of, uh, what shall I say, uh, wriggle space. I usually don't give beyond 10 days because usually by then uh, it has done its work and it's kind of got control of it. Once the uh, uh, CSF cultures are negative and the sugars have started coming out, I usually back off on the intrathecal therapy. Yeah, uh, Is there any more question? Uh, Dr. Yeah, Dr. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi. So uh, we usually stop for intrathecal therapy once the uh, CSF cultures are sterile. So is it the right way to go? Oh, see, the thing is that remember that um, <clears throat> why is the sugar low in uh, uh, bacterial meningitis? It's because you have activated neutrophils. When you have activated neutrophils, the suspicion is that there is still ongoing bacteria-related inflammation. The answer is nobody knows what is the right time to stop. It's a fine balance between stopping too early and going on too long and causing a chemical meningitis. I think it's a very difficult question to answer. There are, uh, what shall I say, uh, people who believe either way. So stopping it once the culture is negative is absolutely fine. See, what I've re realized is this. Let us say you do a series of culture. It's going to take 48 hours for the culture to come back negative. And in that meantime, usually the sugar goes up enough for me to feel happy. Because I like a sugar more than 40. I like a sugar more than 40. If the sugar is more than 40, it means the neutrophils are not going crazy and having oxidative pus. That tells me that the bacteria is probably not there. We have even gone further and we have actually done sometimes even gene sequencing to make sure there are no bacterial products and things like that. That's probably an overkill. That's probably an overkill. Definitely, the minimum should be bacterial culture being negative. Should it be as far as sugar being uh, going up beyond 40? Plus minus. No, because the problem in the nosocomial meningitis is, is, is the diagnosis itself. Actually, the right. blood in the ventricles actually make it very difficult <laughs> to go with the sugars alone. There's a right. lot of blood in the ventricles and it is it is very difficult to go Absolutely with the sugars alone, actually. Absolutely so that's correct. The, uh, it's a challenge. Nosocomial meningitis is actually getting a difficult challenge for us because surgeons wants to give antibiotics since the drain is on and most of the things I try keep telling them that please don't give antibiotics. You are going Correct. to grow resistant organisms. Correct. So that's, Correct. that's, a, no, no, that, that's a very valid point. Thank you for being there. That's a very, very valid point. Uh, in fact, uh, that gives me a thought for the uh, next month's uh, neuroscience, neurocritical conference. I'll probably discuss this as well. Thank you for that. Yes. I'll probably bring this up as a discussion point. Thank you I probably might be the moderator. <laughs> no, I think this is a very important point. Let me try and see if I can incorporate this into the talk because I think this is a very, very critical area. 
and uh, yes you're right because it's basically our uh, love for anti infectives that's coming back to bite us and cns infections are notoriously challenging to treat uh, unfortunately none of the drugs in the horizon really answer this question because even cefepidrocol mm. doesn't seem to be a great choice in this setting so we have a serious problem when it comes to cns infections when it comes to bacterial cns infections mm. and we got to be careful and i agree with you when you have uh, blood in the csf and in the ventricle you really can't make sense of the sugar and protein and things like that it just doesn't make any sense in that kind of a setting if your culture is negative you just cut your losses and move with it i think that's fair enough thank you thank you dr sarab for the nice questions uh, i think sir there are no more questions so with your permission shall we end it absolutely thank absolutely. you sir thank thanks you. for having me here thank, thank you thank you for having me here thank you thank you stay safe everyone bye